I found Asians to be people who had a lot of self-discipline. But the process was a slow one. And I actually took the Declaration of Faith in 1973. Soon after, Rabia married a Javanese Muslim, Bam Bang Wasudo. In the mid-70s, she returned to Australia with her husband and young family and abandoned her faith. Living in that environment, the only thing that really remained of my Islam is that I didn't eat pig. And when police raided their home, cannabis was found in their daughter's cot. Rabia wasn't implicated, but Bam Bang was charged and deported. My father was very anti-drugs and for Bang Bang to be caught was betrayal to my father because he raised his daughter to, to be anti-drugs. He cut ties immediately. Rabia was now alone and caring for two small children. Quite distraught, thinking that I was going to die and I wanted to repent. She found refuge in the heartland of Sydney's Muslim community, Lakemba. When I moved to Lakemba, I saw all these women in scarves. I said, what's that you're wearing on your head? And they said, oh, this is, this is a, a, you know, it's called a hijab, and if a Muslim wants, woman wants to go to paradise, she has to wear one of those. And at that stage, I, <laughs> I, was, I wanted anything that was going to save me, and I said, give me one, and I stuck it on. Rabia immersed herself in Islam. I got to a stage where my thirst for pure Islamic knowledge could not be satisfied anymore in Australia. So I took my children and I returned to Indonesia. Rabia found her way to a hardline Islamic boarding school, Naruki, on the island of Java. I lived within the compound of Naruki and I started to learn Arabic and I learned Hadith and Islamic law from the pure sources. Naruki model of life under strict Islamic law. There would have been a very heavy emphasis on morality and on uh, uh, strict um, rules of dress. The moment you go in the bathroom, you are not allowed to go with the right foot, you go with the left one. Even how to make sex. I'm not, I'm not joking. This is what is described in the Islamic Sharia. They, they, they control you, or you, you feel controlled, if you followed it meticulously, in everything. At Naruki, Rabia married her second husband, Abdul Rahim Ayyub, and raised their children according to the teachings of the school's two founders, Abu Bakr Bashir and Abdullah Sunkar. I have the greatest respect for them. These two men later went on to form Jamaa Islamiyah, the terrorist organisation responsible for the Bali bombings and linked to Al-Qaeda. The lies and the portrayal of him and Abu Bakr Bashir as some kind of hideous monsters that fine human blood easy to spit. I know them as incredible human beings. Rabia disputes Abu Bakr Bashir was involved in the Bali bombing. He said he wasn't and I believe him. Simple as that. In 1985, Rabia and her family moved to Darwin. Her husband, Abdul Rahim Ayyub, became the leader of Jamai Islamia's Australia.
vision. At this time, J.I.'s aim was to create Islamic states in Asia. But back then, it wasn't a terrorist organisation. The IU's role was basically to find recruits, build up a community and provide support to J.I. operations. But Australia couldn't satisfy Rabia's desire for pure Islam. Her marriage ended and she left once again. I wanted to go to a place where Islam was how you lived. It was the late 1980s. The Muslim Mujahideen had claimed victory in Afghanistan and a new force was emerging in the Islamic world. Rabia Hutchinson arrived in Peshawar in Pakistan. Rabia, who would come into this neighbourhood, she would definitely know the people who became the, the, the leadership of Al-Qaeda. Osama bin Laden, Al-Qaeda's current deputy, Dr. Ayman al-Zawahiri, and bin Laden's spiritual leader, Sheikh Abdullah Azam, were all there. You know, I spent four years in Peshawar and I worked with the wife of Sheikh Abdul Azam, rahimullah. She was working as a nurse. She used to take care of the children and those in need of help, even teaching. She refused to take any wages. Rabia worked with Dr. Al Zawahiri, bin Laden's second in charge and a mastermind behind the September 11th attacks. They knew each other, they in the same medical field. And he was a full-time physician when he came to Peshawar, that was his role. And then I think uh, by the end ended up as a full-time terrorist and not as a physician. Somehow, ASIO knew about me having, on occasion, spoken to him. It was in a, a capacity as him as a doctor. And it also, at one stage, before September 11th, they were going to build a state-of-the-art hospital for women in Afghanistan. And they'd asked me to be um, responsible for that facility. By 1998, Al-Qaeda had declared a war on the West and its base was Afghanistan. During this time, Rabia Hutchinson travelled there with her children to live under the Taliban. I didn't want to be bombarded with music and nakedness and alcohol and drugs and the lies about how Afghanistan was under the Taliban is pure and simply that, it's lies. They live in kind of enclaves where they socialize uh, the other women of jihadis. It's very much like military wives, where they live on base, they meet every afternoon for tea, and they gossip. I lived in an apartment block that belonged to the Taliban and it was full of Arabs. We were a community of about 500 families. So, who did I know? Who knows who I knew? Rabia married Mustafa Hamid. In the way their, um, their own social status is dependent on the social status of their husband within the jihad. In Osama bin Laden's inner circle, Rabia's husband, Mustafa Hamid, was known as Abu al-Walid al-Mazri. He was an al-Qaeda strategist and critic of bin Laden and the September 11 attacks. Abu al-Walid al-Mazri is more of an ideologue within al-Qaeda. He was advising bin Laden on the general direction of uh, 